die rive gaat jou slaan, kie my foutje roof, kom my rang dag. Which is, hello, oh noble friends, a hundred thousand welcomes to my little class. That's just to, to show off that I do, in fact, know a bit of Irish. Um, are there any Irish speakers here? No, lots of nods. Oh, the other thing is if you click on participants, there are all these little um, buttons where you can go yes and no and go slower and go faster. Um, so that can be useful sometimes too. I might call on you to, to do that. An Irish singer from Adelaide to Beaumont. So uh, does that mean you, oh, two weeks of Gaelic. It could help. That, so. that means I wanted to record some songs in Gaelic and I, I am deeply distrustful of uh, other people's translations. And so I had to learn enough Irish to translate my own so I knew what I was saying. That seems entirely fair. Um, I started learning Gaelic because I heard the song uh, the theme to Harry's game by Clonard and wanted to know what the hell they were singing because it sounded lovely. I now know what it was they were singing. I also know that they speak a particularly abstruse dialect of Northern Irish Gaelic uh, from a place called Kosharga, which is almost incomprehensible to both Scots Gaelic and Irish Gaelic speakers because that's just how it goes. Uh, uh, Willock McMurdog lived next to Wales. So are we talking Surrey or Cumbria? Actually, I lived in um, uh, RAF Ensworth um, in Gloucester on the, on the edge of the Seven Estuary for two years. So the, we learned bits of well, Welsh, but mm, you know. Shawnee Buddha. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's pretty well the only Welsh I can remember is from uh, one of the Terry Pratchett books where Shawnee Bordar is the name of the Bardic song, which is Johnny Be Good. Yeah. Um, oh, it, more people joining. Yay. So what I'll be trying to cover in this is Gaelic. Where it comes from, what the differences are, how it changed over time, roughly how it's pronounced and how we know and then moving on to the naming systems which is what we're presumably concentrating on being heralds but we'll try and um there's a lot of ground to cover i will talk a lot i will probably skip things so if there's something you don't understand sing out and tell me and say stop what does that word mean and i'll, I'll go back and cover it because i've clearly missed something uh First question is, where did the Gales, the, the Celts come from generally? So if we're going to talk about the Irish, we should probably go all the way back and talk about the Celtic peoples, the Celtic languages. And hopefully this is the right. Yeah, that's a window. So this is a map of the various Celtic tribes from Europe, um, or Celtic, the, the red ones are the Germanic, the green ones are the Celtic. There's this big purple section here. Uh, move over to the dictionary page. It's just showing the Celtic tribes and where they started from. So you see this uh, little place called Hallstatt, uh, just north of Italy. That's where we think the Celts started being Celts and from that point they moved out. So that's where Hallstatt is where the earliest Celtic archaeological finds came from. Laten was the next big cultural center so you might hear people talking about Hallstatt Celts and Laten Celts. It's early, early Celts. And the names of the tribes you see on this map are the names of Celtic tribes that were known to the Romans because the Romans wrote it down. You can see that this is going from 
Ireland all the way across to almost the Black Sea. Celts controlled Europe, almost all of Europe. Uh, so obviously there was a big spread. There were a lot of languages across this. We know a lot of the languages that they were speaking from inscriptions and from descriptions by people like the, the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, See, so people like uh, Plato and Strabo knew about the Celts. And I think it was Plato who first called them the Keltoi. So that's, that's where our word for them comes from. They, of course, called themselves all sorts of things because they, they were the people. Everyone else needed a name to, to tell you who they were. And they were usually by their own tribes. So um, by the time you get to the Prima Bella Gallica, it, it looked a bit more like this, where everything in yellow was the Roman Empire, the earlier Roman Empire. Gallia, which spread across into Eastern Europe, Germania above it, Dacia, Pannonia, Dalmatia. But already the Celtic peoples had been pushed back. So the Cisalpine Gauls. So you have the Alps, and Latin had two words to describe where something was in relation to another thing. Trans or cis, or kiss in, in classical Latin. Cisalpine Gauls were the Gauls on this side of the Alps. Transalpine Gauls were the ones on the other side of the Alps. The ones on this side of the Alps were a problem because the Romans considered that to be Italia and therefore their natural domain. So they had to conquer the Cisalpine Gauls first, which of course they did. And then they conquered Greece and then they moved through to Hispania. Hispania was the first Celtic region that they conquered. Um, you see this little white bit here, Aquitania. Aquitania was never Celtic. It still isn't Celtic or Romance. It's where a people live called the Basque. As near as we can tell, the Basque is the last remnant of the language that was spoken before the Indo-Europeans arrived in Europe. So you had all these languages, you've got the Semitic languages around the uh, around Asia Minor and through the Holy Lands and into Egypt. You've got the Berber and the Cushitic languages in North Africa. In Europe, you had, well, we don't know what. One of them was a language that we now know as Basque. When the Indo-Europeans swept through, all of those other languages except for Basque basically got swept away. Some of them might have been pushed aside. So you might have the Finno-Ugric languages. So the last remnants being Finnish, Estonian and Hungarian in that family. They might have been spoken before the Indo-Europeans arrived and are the last spots of those. To that extent, we don't know. And notice here I'm talking about languages, not of peoples. There is a massive, massive difference between the identity between a language and a person uh, and, and, a, and a people. So when you start having racism and you start talking about Celts as being a race, as a nation of the Celts, a nation of the Germans, that fairly obviously gets into big problems which have been revealed in the last 150 years or so. And anyway, there is a mapping between genetics and language, but it's only a secondary level of mapping. What we're really looking at here is language changes and language migrations. So clearly the modern French aren't Romans, they aren't Italians, but they speak an Italic language now because Roman overtook them. That's a language change, not a population change. Uh, stop sharing that. Let's see where I am. No, I don't want that to settle down. Let's 
share. This one. There were lots of tribes. Each tribe thought of themselves as a people, but they recognized that they were united by a language. Some of these tribes were bigger than others. So you see down here in Surrey, there's this little tribe called the Belgai. The Belgai were also known on the mainland. That's where the word Belgium comes from. They were a big, big, well spread out nation of the Celts. And this map doesn't show it, but we are fairly certain that the Belgai ended up in Ireland as well. Down here in Devon were the Dumnonii. Uh, there's the Damnonii, probably the same people, just a bit of dialect change or a mistranscription when someone wrote it down. Again, a big spread of people across all of Europe. And we're pretty sure that they were in Ireland as well. Um, but stepping back and looking at the spread of the Celts across Europe, there were different languages across the Celtic nations. When we get to the time of Caesar, which is about the earliest that we can get and have a a really serious idea of what's going on. You're looking at Gaul, um, Iberian, Celt-Iberian, and the insular languages, the languages spoken on Britain and in Ireland. What we think happened was that the people coming into Britain came in from the north, from Gaul. The people who came into Ireland came around the other direction from Hispania. There are a few reasons for this. One of them is language spread. So the theory is that the varieties of Celtic spread through from France into Spain. There was more or less a continuum of dialect. So there was no real place where you could stop and say the language on this side of the border is a completely different one from the one on that side of the border. There's always some sort of gradation of changes. When those two came together across the Irish Sea, the differences were big enough that they were considered different languages. That's one theory. Another theory is that they all spread across the, the British Channel, became a separate Brit, um, insular language group, and then split into Irish and British. It's a matter of some debate. But when we look at things like the Irish myths, the Irish myth come in four main slabs, and the earliest one is called the Lévor Gbala Erin, the Book of the Invasions of Ireland, which gives you a clue right there, because they didn't think of Ireland as being created. In the myths, Ireland was always just sort of there until it was invaded. And then they died out, and it was invaded again, and it was invaded again, and again, and again leaving substrates of the previous invasions behind, which kind of makes sense if you think of Ireland coming out from under the ice sheets after the Great Ice Age, and it was just there. And then people discovered it and they moved in and they may have struggled a bit and died and then a new set and they found these human remains and spread out and then someone else came in and invaded and wiped them out and replaced them with themselves waves of invasions and, and understrates. One of the reasons we know, you see this map of the tribes of Ireland, and these are the ones that the Romans knew about. So you see the Cauci, the Menapii, the Coriondi, the Brigantes, Ustii, Iverni. The Iverni down the bottom, that's where Hibernia comes from. So it's from the name of the Iverni that the name of Ireland in Latin comes from. But in the Irish myth, before the current people arrived, there were a group called the Firbolag. And the Firbolag were like the Milesians, who eventually ended up being the Irish. Um, 
but different, but still equal, as good as. It wasn't their fault that they were replaced by the Tuatadanan and eventually by the Milesians. They, were, they eventually came to a sort of peace. And the Fir Bolag came in three groups in the myth. The Fir Bolag, the Fir Dawan, and the Fir Lahan. Which is the Viri Belgai, the Viri Dumnoni, and the Viri Legini, which aren't reflected here, but there you have the Fir, Fir Dawan is the men of the Dumnoni. Fir Bolag is the men of the Belgai. Fir Legini turned into Lagan, which turned into Leinster. But they're not there. So according to that theory, there was a, because there were other peoples before the Fir Bolag, according to that theory, there were the pre-Indo-European inhabitants of Ireland. Then the Britons came through from Britain in one big sweep across the Irish Sea as well and left their peoples all over and they were the Fir Bolag. Then the Irish included the Torha de Danon, who were the, basically the gods. So whether that's another wave of invasions or just a narrative explanation for how the gods came to be. And then the Milesians who came to their peace with the Fir Bolag and left them places to live in Ireland. So this is a linguistic replacement, not a, a population, um, you know, not a genocide. They moved in and subsumed them rather than replaced them. Which is why all of these places have these, these names. We can't see what became the big difference between these two islands being the PQ split yet. So that's another thing where it might have been a pronunciation difference that became stronger because of that difference between the populations rather than some big um, meaningful incomprehension between them. They, they, they kind of knew what they were talking, but the languages were different enough that they split apart. Move down here and we can see Roman Britain. Flavia Caesariensis, Maxima Caesariensis, Britannic, Britannia Secunda. And now we see that the old tribes have merged into the five provinces, the Cuigia. So the word for province in Irish is a Cuigia, which literally just means a fifth. Oli, Miva, Leirin, Muvo, and Cunachta. And you can obviously see Ulster, Leinster, Meath, uh, sorry, Meath in the middle, Munster and Connacht. So when you see those nations, that's when you start seeing the Red Branch cycle, the Cúhulan cycle of myths. That's set in this period, where Cúhulan came from Ulster, uh, Maeve came from Connacht, and they declared war on each other, and all of the other provinces kind of got dragged in to this massive fight. The, the um, Book of Invasions was written after Christianity had, had arrived. The Red Branch was probably written another 200 years after that. The next set of myths being Finn McCool was probably written about 200 years after that. And the historical King cycle was probably written about 200 years after that in the Middle Irish period. So by the time they were writing down the myths of the kings of the five, six, seven hundreds, it was already the 10th century, 11th century that they were writing those myths down. Uh, then it starts splitting up even more. So we've got the Anglo-Saxons. England. You can see Sutherland and Cape. Caithness, Dufflin, Cork, Waterford. When the Norse arrived in Ireland, they built the first cities. Before the Norse, there was no such thing as a city in Ireland. There were fortresses where a particular um, 
Torth would have its base. So a, a nation would be based around its warlord. He would be the, the king of that, that family, that larger group. He would have his base uh, with a controllable region of farmland around it, but there were no cities as we now know them. The Norse built the first cities. There were one at, the, at Cork, which is a wonderful harbour, one in Waterford, which is a wonderful harbour, one in Dublin, which is a wonderful harbour and absolutely shite for anything else. Dublin is where there are three or four separate rivers coming together. So you've got the, the, the Liffey and lots of other little creeks and rivulets and things all coming together into one giant great big swamp, which is why it's called Dovlin, Black Pool. It's a great marshy mire that no one in their right mind would live on. The Irish didn't live there. They lived in a small village up the river where it was a bit nicer and a lot shallower. And they built a ford across the river there and then lined the bottom with wicker to make it easier to traverse. So that was Bolia or Clear, the town of the wicker hurdle. It's the Irish word for Dublin, even though Dolvelin is an Irish name because that was the Irish settlement, Dublin was Norse. And then when the English arrived, or should I say the Normans, they settled in Dublin because it was convenient. And then it jumps from 920 or so in the height of the Viking period to you know, more or less 1900, 1800, 1900. And we've got all of the counties and this is after the, the English have been going through Ireland and setting the Irish against each other, setting themselves against the Irish, uh, making being Irish illegal, lots of things going on to, to, to cause fracturing and, and fun. But that's, that's the end of period, if anything. Uh, stop and share. So we have this basic movement. So we know that they came across the Irish Sea. We don't know whether it was in, well, we know it was in two waves. We don't know the exact directions. Oh, the other reason why we, we're pretty sure that the Irish came from, from Hispania is because the Irish myths tell us so. Oh, there's more people, I should let them in. Um, we know that the, um, the Irish myth, the Torha Didanum, the Milesians are named after their founder called Miles Hispania, which for those who know their Latin is just a Spanish soldier. That's literally the name that he's given in the myths for the guy who invaded Ireland and took over. So they're, they're called the Milesians after him. We also know it's late because Miles Hispania has a P in it. Why is that relevant? Hey, okay, so in Britain, we've got the British speaking peoples. In Ireland, we have the Gaelic speaking peoples. Someone's unmuted themselves. I don't know if they're just saying hello or if they're going to ask a question. No. Okay, so what is the difference between those? If you look at it linguistically, British is called a P Celtic language and Goidelic is called a Q Celtic language. Why? P and Q have a really convoluted history in Indo-European, especially in the Western half. So you think about the Greek word for four and five. Uh, Trying to remember the Greek word for four now. Uh, I know five is penta. In Latin, it's tetra. Petra. Tetra. Tetra is four? Of course it is. Um, in Latin, it's quartus um, quintus. In Indo European, we're pretty sure it was uh, qu qu. So, 
Okay, let's bring up a offers. Let's bring up a text window. Come on, text window. And we will view zoom width and we will share that. Okay. So in Indo-European, there were two, depending on how you count it, three types of the letter K. What do you mean types of K? That K is K. So you've got, let's make this much, much, much bigger so everyone can see, not that big. Can you read that? Yes, okay, awesome. So I had the K. So if you look at, at Latin, because Latin's a nice simple one to demonstrate, you had K as in calidus, uh, calma. It's a K, simple K. You had, uh, let's see if I can remember how to do. Kia sound, a palatalized ki, as if you're saying uh, kick, kind, key. It's a qualitatively different sounding type of K. And in Indo-European and in a lot of other languages, they distinguish it. In, um, in Latin, they just spelt it with a C again, um, killa. Makin, makina. And then there was the labialized K, the quo, which was K, do the magic to get quo, which in Latin they spelt with a Q U, the quiero. This last one in Indo-European was a separate letter and different languages did different things to it when they stopped being Indo-European and became Proto-Italic, Proto-Germanic, Proto-Hellenic, proto, proto, proto uh, Sarmathian, Proto-whatever. Uh, there were lots of weird rules. Uh, the word five was Something like quenque. Those two qu together in the same word did different things. So in some languages, it became penque to pente. Uh, in Latin, it became quinte. Uh, and then to French as quinze. But that's because there were two of them there. In Germanic, the qu became a p, and then Grimm's Law, which you may have heard of, turned the p into a f, which is why we have four and five because in Germanic, the qu both turn into p, the, the nasalization went away, the p's turn into f's, and other things that the, or the, the m, no, the m went away and changed the vowel, Feev is how it was spelt in Old English, and then to five. Came from the same root. In 
Proto-Celtic, in Insular Celtic, the P sound, just the straight P, went away. In Britonic, they created a new P out of some of the Qu sounds, but not all of them. In Goidelic, the P went away and stayed away. They had to re <clears throat> they had to reinvent the P sound later. So in uh, Primitive Irish and Old Irish, there is no technically no P sound. So when they borrowed a name, like say Patricius, the Irish couldn't pronounce it. They called him Cothrigia. They turned the P into a qu sound and the qu into a k. A word like sun in primitive Irish was makko. In Britonic, such as um, what turned into Welsh, that qu sound turned into a P, which is why in modern Welsh it's map. But in Irish, it turned into muck. So that's the bas basic difference. That one sound turned into a qu and then k in Irish and a p in British, usually. There were other things going on which prevented it being universal, but that's the basic rule. So that's the basic difference between Goidelic, which is the Q languages, and Britonic, which is the P languages. Right about now, some people might be saying, what about up here? Or oh, what about up here? What about in Scotland? What about the Picts? And the answer with the Picts is, we don't know. We are utterly, utterly uh, floundering. We have no idea what's going with the Picts, mainly because, okay, the Picts did write things down. They wrote them down in Ogham. The trouble is, Ogham is designed for a Q Celtic language. There is no letter P in classical Ogham. So, was Pictish a Q language? We don't know. Maybe they just used P instead of Q because they knew that they were the same language in that dialect at that time. We do know that apart from some of the names, we can't make head nor tail of Pictish Ogham stones. It's just more or less complete gibberish. The letters are there and the letters make words, but the orthography is different. The grammar is different. The vocabulary is different as far as we can tell. There is one clue and that's in other Celtic nations name for the Picts. Picts didn't call themselves the Picts. That was the Latin word for them, the Picti, the painted people whether it was because they used word or whether it was because they had tattoos, we don't know, no one's around to tell us. What the Irish called them was the, Kruthnia. Kruthnia, if you take it back to primitive Gaelic, becomes, uh, Perimeter. Only that C isn't a C, it's a Q. Uh, uh, tin, tin, no, sorry. If we replace the Q with a P, And that is basically the word of Britain. So there is a clue in the name that the Picts were British speaking P Celtic Celts who may have come from yet another part of Gaul and remained separate from the, the rest of the Celtic tribes on the British Isles. So by the time that our records turn up, they were so different that they weren't recognized as being anything like even the same language. Again, 
We've got very little recorded instances of Pictish. What we've got, we can't make head nor tail of. All we've got are hints and clues and a little bit of, yeah, it kind of makes sense if it did that. Let's, let's just go with that until we find out some better explanation. We know that by the time of the Venerable Bede, the great historian of Anglo-Saxon England, he described the five languages of the British Isles. He called, he called them Theorde. On dam Ireland sund fiv Theorde. Um, a theod is sometimes translated as a, a people or a nation. It's sometimes translated as a language. To their mind, that was the same thing. A people was united by a common language. Smaller than that, you had a family. Bigger than that, you had a war. Um, theod in Germany became Teuta, which is where the very word Teutons comes from. It was just a word for a people, a language, a nation. In Irish, the same word, probably from the Indo-European, became Tortha, which is where, you know, the Tortha de Danann, the people of the goddess Danu, is what the Tortha de Danann means. Same word running through the whole thing. And in modern Irish, it's gone through even more twists. So Torth in modern Irish means countryside. So you go for a, a fine, fine day out, some tour in the countryside, not in the nation. Um, okay, so we've got the Celts, we've, we've mentioned Bede. Let's stop sharing that and start sharing back to this one where we can go to. So let's have a look at the various levels of language. So Proto-Celtic was probably similar in Ireland, in England, in Gaul. There were going to be differences. Um, there were going to be very obvious differences if you could speak it. They're not so obvious to us because they're all in languages that no one's spoken in literally 2000 years. The Irish started leaving a big corpus of text with their organ stones. Here is a photograph of an Ogham stone. There are two angles of the same one. Here is a drawing of that stone. Here is a transcription of the Ogham on it. Was Ogham easy to read? No. Was Ogham easy to write? No. We know that it was being used, uh, well, we know it was being used around the four or 500 mark. And we're pretty sure it was used for more than just writing people's names on stones because the legends of Kukulin talk about people sending messages carved on sticks in Ogham. Ireland is not a place amenable to preserving sticks. So if any of those were ever done, we have no record of them. All of the Ogham stones are memorial stones. They are to the memory of a person. And this one is clearly to the memory of a woman by the name of Avitoria Filia Cunigni. You can tell because it's written there very clearly in Latin. Oh, and around the sides here on the corners, organ requires being written on the edge of a stone uh, canonically. You can see these little marks, which if you read from the bottom up, stop grabbing it even bottom up on both sides, you can see Inigena Kunigni Avitoriges. We can see that Ogham had a letter for V or W, we think. We're pretty sure. That letter became F in later language. So where there's a f in a, in a name in Ogham, the Old Irish will have an F. But here it's still a, transcribed as a V because we don't know if it was a F sound or a W sound. The V in Latin by this stage was very definitely a W moving over to sometimes a F sound, which is why the 
is so variable depending on which language you're listening to it from, whether it's a, you know, whether you're reading German or um, English or, or French, the, the V sound can, can move around from a V to a W. In classical Latin, it was a W. Uh, or also a vowel. So I and you in Latin did double duty. This will become relevant, I promise. When it was in a obviously vowel context, it was a obviously a vowel. It was U, E. If on the other hand, it was in a place where it could act as a consonant, then it probably did. And in that case, it was W, Y. So in this context, in the, the woman's first name, it's Awi Toria. Or possibly, Awi Toria. But uh, that doesn't really work with how the, um, the stresses probably would have gone. In the father's name, it's obviously a vowel, Kunigni. The Anglo-Saxons realized that there was a difference and they used the letter win for the consonant and you for the vowel all of the time. The Irish didn't have that luxury. So that's an example of Old Irish. Oh, and I also use this because this is one of the few ogham stones for a woman. Most of them were to men. Almost all of them are in the genitive case. Again, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this is very clearly and indisputably a woman's memorial stone. So she must have been very special. Also, look at where it was located. Last I checked, Carmarthenshire wasn't in Ireland. Around this period, the 400s, 500s, the Irish were raiding into Wales and Cornwall. So there are Ogham locations in southern Wales and Cornwall, as well as in Ireland, as well as in Scotland. Let's move on a couple of hundred years. So Priscian was a late no, mid empire, Latin grammar, grammarian. That's the word. I know the words. I can. I have all of the words. He wrote a, la, a grammar of Latin, and as grammars go, it's actually a pretty good one. He um, referred to Greek. He'd talk about other languages and how they responded, uh, breaking up the Latin language and. Um, putting it back together so you could see how it worked for the benefit of not just for the Romans, but for people who were learning Latin. Because you had this great big wide world where you had to learn Latin if you wanted to work with the Roman Empire, whether that was the Roman Empire in Rome or the Roman Empire in Byzantium. Or if you were in any way religious because you had to learn Latin to read the Bible. And because Christianity was a thing, everyone wanted to read the Bible, so everyone was learning Latin which meant that all the monasteries in Ireland, which never had the Romans arrive, had ways of teaching Latin. Even, um, even Patrick in his uh, Confessio, one of the, the earliest autobiographies, apologizes for how bad his Latin was because he'd spent 40 years in Ireland never needing to speak it. But they were teaching themselves Latin. They didn't know it. So the St. Gaul Priscian, which is now in St. Gallen in Switzerland because old books end up all over the place, has glosses written all the way through it by someone who was trying to make sense of what they were reading in the Latin. So they were glossing the words in Old Irish, which is one of the ways we know what a lot of these things were known as in Old Irish. They, they quite happily wrote down the word for it in Old Irish next to the Latin, except for this this was written across the top of a page and is one of the earliest poems in Old Irish. And it reads, Is achering gaithinocht for forsna farga finult, ni agorem moramin don laich re da lochlin. Which translates as, Bitter is the wind tonight, whipping up the white haired sea. I do not fear the coming of the sea wolves, those blood-stained warriors, 
from Loch Lind. We're pretty sure Loch Lind is a variant of Loch Long, which is to say Norway. So what, he's, what the poem's saying is, it's blowing a gale outside, which is good because it means we don't have to worry about Vikings tonight. So there you have a, a bit of a view of um, the things that were occupying the minds of monks while they were learning Latin in the middle of the ninth century. We can see some interesting features of Old Irish just in this little poem. Acher with a CH. Um, in Gaith with a TH. What's this dot doing over the F? But there's a dot here under the C. I'll, I'll get to that when we talk more about the features of Old Irish. Um, but these are all interesting. There's lots of scribal interest going on. There's grammatical and linguistic interest going on. There's cultural and historical interest going on. But let's continue our whistle stop tour and move to the Book of Deer. The Book of Deer is notable for being Scottish because it was a 10th century. So the original book is literally just Latin. It's a Bible, the you know, Book of John, Book of Mark, uh, written about 100 years after the glossing was done in the St. Gaul Priscian. But then there's this other bit that was added in the 12th century, which makes it Middle Irish, but it's referring to grants of land, land in Scotland, and it's referring to Scottish kings. It's also referring to Scottish saints. So the first two names on this line, Colum Killer, Argus Drostan McCoskreg. There they are, very clearly. You can see it's basically the same script. You can read one, you can read the other. There's more interesting things going on there that I'll talk about when I talk about the linguistic differences. Here we have the Aurecept Menecus, the wisdom of the ancients. How do we know so much about uh, Ogham? Because a thousand years after they stopped using it, they were still writing about it. There are 18th and 19th century Ogham stones that were obviously people who had still knew enough about how Ogham and primitive Irish worked to be able to create new memorial stones in that style, despite the English making it illegal around the time of um, Elizabeth. All Irish education was basically made illegal under um, the, the late Elizabeth. The Wisdom of the Ancients was one of the works that sat down and described how Ogham worked. It gave an alphabet list of Ogham. It um, talked about, in case Ogham isn't obscure enough for you, here are some even more obscure variants of Ogham so you can be cryptic while you're being cryptic in your secret messages. Um, it includes runes, it includes made up scripts, it includes ciphers. It includes, because it's a general book of education, it includes uh, history, it includes uh, works of law, of poetry. The Irish really did love their, their learning to the extent of having families dedicated to scholarship. So being a judge could be hereditary like you were a judge, like your father was a judge, like his father back for 500 years, being a historian. Being a historian was really, really important because kingship was based on history. In most European countries, whether you are the king depends on immediate history. Are you the eldest son of the king or are you the guy standing over the king with a bloody sword? That's pretty immediate as far as history goes. Ireland had the tarnistry, which is more like a, an electorate. What you had was a list of people who were, the Irish word translates as king worthy. 
when the previous king died, it wasn't always the case that his son would become the next king. What would happen was his son would go into the pool of the king worthy and the Tarnists, the electors, would go and make a selection from the available candidates who were around to, to be used. It might be, it might be the eldest son. It might be the king's brother or the king's uncle or a fourth cousin or some guy from the next kingdom over who everyone agreed his, his ancestor was a really great king of these parts. So let's make, make him the king. Later historians from outside Ireland looking at the Irish and the Scottish king lists would go through these things and say, but this guy isn't that guy's son. That it almost never went from father to son. Wow, they must have been really bloody and bloodthirsty in those times. There was always these conquests. And okay, sometimes there was conquest. More often than not, though, it was politics. There were elections. There was um, people going around and lobbying for, for their case. It was far more civilized than, well, the War of the Roses ever was. Uh, so stop share for the moment so you can come back and look at my ugly face and I can see what you're talking about. And does anyone have any questions at this point? Because I've just gone through a whistle stop tour of the very basics. I'm going to go back over some of the linguistics of it. So is everyone staring with glazed over faces? <laughs> okay. So in primitive Irish, there are some things that Gaelic is known for that aren't there. Okay, well, there's a lot of stuff that isn't there because it's literally just names and there's not a lot of grammar you can get out of a name. We know that they're almost always in the genitive. We know that Goidelic Irish was declined very much like Latin was. So if you look at, see if I can go back to here. So um, Dom no Galos was a, was a typical, that would be a, a typical name. To get the genitive of it, belonging to Dom no Galos, Dom no Gal Li. Which if you take it to Latin, you have the nominative Quintus and the genitive Quinti. So there's a similar thing going on there. So when you get to Old Irish, these old roots, Domnogalos would be called an O-stem declension noun because the ending of the noun in the nominative used to end with an O, os. You might have a first, well, what's in Latin called a first declension noun, which in Irish was an A-stem, such as the word for daughter, which we've just run into. Ini gena, which ends with an A, uh, which in the genitive would be ni genas. A little bit different from the first first declension in Latin, but you, know, you, you get the idea. They've got the same sort of declension tables going on. What happened between primitive Irish or Ogham Irish, which was um, spoken before 600 AD or so, and Old Irish, which was spoken between 600 and 900. A few things. One of them is these endings dropped off. Some of these um, syllables in the middle kind of vanished. Sometimes they got replaced with an uh, a shiva, epenthesis it's called. Um, another thing that happened was a process called lenition. Lenition is really important in Irish and in Welsh and seems to be surprisingly badly understood. So lenition is literally just the process of a softening of a consonant. So say you start with 
well, let's clear this, a G sound. Don't do that. That's going to do that whether I want it to or not. Start with a G sound, a G. In many languages, in some phonetic contexts, that G would no longer be pronounced G as a hard voiced plosive G. It might get softened a bit. And if you spell that difference in sound, you might want to indicate with something like an H. Now, like, um, it's not a lot. There's just a little bit of extra stuff going on at the back of the throat. And then the B becomes over time as it becomes more and more strongly lenited. Then you might have um, OGH become oh, where it's almost not there at all. And then that might turn into O. Oh. And oh, look, that's what happened with English, where plog in pre Germanic, yeah, the English that was English before it was English was plog became plog in Middle English became plow. That is lenition. Lenition happened in English. Lenition is happening all the time. If you look at Greek, uh, let's go to Greek. In classical Greek, it's beta, delta, uh, gamma. In modern Greek, it's veta, velta, yama. If you want to, to, to spell the letter B, as we say it in English, in Greek, you spell it beta. M, mu, veta becomes meta or beta in, in modern Greek because the beta has lenited over time. This is a really big, important process in Irish because what happened was, so you have inigena bega, so a small daughter. Any letter between two vowels, one, two, three, oh wait, this one is always after Inigena. This one becomes lenited as well. Oh. Oh, I'm being told. Stop share. Oh, Donald's been kicked out. He wants to be let back in. Here we go. Hopefully he's back in. Ray. So if we go back to where we were, let's stop that, inigena. So everything, every consonant that's between two vowels gets lenited. And they didn't spell it in Proto-Celtic, in Primitive Irish, because they didn't need to. Every consonant between two vowels was lenited. Just a little bit, but just a hint. Inigena, vera. Just this little hint of a, a softening of the thing in between these two vowels. Over time, it became stronger. Some consonants, you couldn't actually tell that it was lenited. Lenited N and unlenited N, it's the same thing. So they just didn't bother with that sort of thing. But G, yes. B, yes. They were lenited. Then another thing happened, which was the endings dropped off. The lenition didn't. So the lenition was how you knew what the word before used to start with. And this is where we come up with an important thing as well. There are two types of lenition. There is the phonetic lenition, which is the softening of the sound that's happening to all of these letters 
the, the name of the effect, and there's grammatical lenition, which is what's happening to that B. That is a phonetic softening with grammatical force. It means something because if you had dormant, why are you italic? Dormant nalos, begos. See that S there? That's not a vowel, which means that B isn't lenited. So an adjective that comes after a masculine noun isn't lenited, but an adjective that comes after a feminine noun is. And that's still the rule in present day Gaelic. And that's where it came from. Lenition is the ghost of a word ending that disappeared 1500 years ago. And the I there, that I also dropped out. But the N and the G, especially the G, was still lenited. And that made a difference in pronunciation. How do we know? Because there was another word that in Old Irish was spelt Ingen. But we know that came from Ingenos. Because one, it's masculine. It doesn't lenite the word that comes after it. And two, this ng was an ing, not an n -r. So that g was never lenited, and it's still pronounced ingen rather than ingen. Uh, hold on a second. We have people in your waiting room. I have to look in my waiting room. Is there more people in my waiting room? Ah, Amelia is still in my waiting room. More people in my waiting room. Um, so we can tell from how a word looks now what it looked like then by the changes that have happened to it. There was one other change that happened. Let's go back here again, which was some words ended with an N or sometimes the uh, dative form of it would end in an N. That didn't leave it alone like the S did. It didn't lenite it like the B did. It, like the, sorry, like the vowel did. It caused a thing called nasalization. So nasalization would be, I can't remember a word that ends with N, so let's just invent one and um, stop being italic. Dovalen uh, Began. So here we have what was probably a neuter noun ending in N and the B after it, well, it's not lenited and it's not left alone. And this probably didn't hang around either. So that will become Dovol. but it still nasalized the word that came after it. In Old Irish, that was nasalization. That became eclipsis in Modern Irish. And we'll have a look at that process in a second. One of the other things about Old Irish, like I said, we don't know a lot about verbs in Primitive Irish because they basically didn't write any. We have no idea about grammar or declension or any of those things. We do know about verbs in Old Irish and what we know about verbs in Old Irish is that they were insanely complicated and they make strong men go utterly, utterly mad. So what would happen is you'd have a root, bear, B-E-I-R, and then you might have a prefix for it. Well, at first you'd have the declension of it. Bear, berim, berid, beras, berant, all the same things that you remember from your Latin class. Amo, amas, amat, amant, amantis, all of those. Well, we, we now know 
how many people were doing the thing. Um, we know roughly when they were doing the thing. So we've got the, the tense, we've got the number, we've probably got the voice. Old Irish also had prefix particles. So Robern is uh, a perfective sense. So it's, I have carried. It's a thing that's happened in the past. Uh, it could also mean, uh, forbearing means I've carried too much. So if we go have a look at our, where are we, old Irish. For Forsna. Forson or force means to disturb or to stir. It's a really, really simple, mild, common word. Forsna is a third person, kind of like a passive. You know, you know, it, something else is doing this stirring. What's this? For? That's the prefix particle for, which means too much over ex, you know overextended so forstner means it disturbs for forstner means it whips up it's, it gives an extra level of force and emphasis to the to the level of activity uh knee was a negation knee berim i don't carry then we have another level where the object of the verb can be shoved in between these prefix particles and the verb itself. Romerim, with an M in there, is I carry me. So, so we have bear to carry which is the same root as in barren or to bear, bear a load. Same, same root. Bear him, I carry. Door and in the grammars, they use a um, midpoint to, to differentiate between these are the bits that go before and these is, this is the actual verb. Door bearing, I have carried. It's a perfective sort of sense or Roberim, or Goberim, or Nibelim. But what if I'm carrying it to me, or so, Ro, Romerim. Nasalization, the M and the B combine to become M, so the B isn't pronounced anymore. So Romerim, already it doesn't look like the original word. Then we have conjoint and disjoint verbs where you have a word and it kind of changes if you want to whether you want to put prefixes before it or not uh, so uh, what's the word for um reeve or reem to count uh a dream to account. Ad in this sense is like acting like ak in, in Latin or ag. It's to, uh, an action towards. So to count, at count, accounting. So rim is count, a rim is a count. But then, where are you going? Kovadrim is to, com is exactly the same as cum in Latin, with ad count, to reckon, to calculate. The modern Irish word for a, to count is, uh, or a, a thing who counts is a reavira, which is also the word for a computer, because computer is just Latin for thing which counts. So that's where that word comes from. And um, email is um, computer post, which is 
refreshed. Literary counting post. But that's beside the point. In modern Irish, we've got um, Orem, uh, and Riev are all still verbs in modern Irish. They all originally come from this bit and the things you could do to it. So to talk to someone was to bear words to them. So aber comes from ad bear. Aber is from aber. Don't try and understand old Irish v verbs. I, I have here a copy of, no, not, not to mean, where's my, no, it's in the other room. I have a copy of Rudolf Thornason's Old Irish Grammar. It is about yay thick, and about three quarters of it is verbs. It is insanely intense and complicated and makes strong people go utterly, utterly mad, which may explain, explain the Old Irish. There is, in fact, a no fooling theory that the verbal system for Old Irish was only ever used for a few years and then became so complicated it fell apart under its own weight and was then kept alive for another 300 years by, um, by academics as a joke or possibly to show off. Um, I, I was describing this to a linguist friend of mine once and he responded that it was like, um, like the Byzantines who like to show off how good they were with language. And he said that the Byzantines loved to use the optative case and sometimes they even used it correctly. But we're more worried about the phonetic changes. So we've, we've got the lenition and the, um, the beginnings of initial mutation, the, the nasalization and the grammatical lenition at the beginning of words and all of these words chopping, changing, losing syllables. Go home all Irish, you're drunk. I have often said that. That is, that is really a, literally a thing I have said. Um, by the time you get to Middle Irish, Middle Irish kind of technically isn't a thing. By about 1200, you have what we call mod, um, early modern Irish. So in Oscar Coventry and name, we're saying after 1200, it's early modern Irish. Middle Irish is a period between Old Irish and early modern Irish when they were figuring out what this new language had and how they could deal with it properly, how they could spell it in its own way. There were things like, in Latin, if you had a two vowels together, especially if they were U and I, then that would be a semi-vowel and a vowel. A U and an I would be we. A U and an A would be wa. So a vacuum, if you think about how vacuum is spelt, in Latin, you had a U and an A and a U and a U. In classical Latin, that would be vacuum because that's just how it worked. You didn't have this oo-woom thing going on with a long vowel. That would be a different process altogether. Two U's was woo. Uh, in Irish, you could have ua as its own word. And we know that because it was its own word. How did you write ua so that it wasn't read by someone who was used to Latin as wa? Because that would be wrong and stupid. What they did was they put an H in front of it. And that would mean that it was a marker that this isn't Latin because Latin didn't use H's. It had an H, but it practically never used it. So they used the H as a marker. They didn't pronounce the H either. Uh, Paul Fitzdennis, exactly. In a lot of old Irish manuscripts, that's how you'll find or spelt with an H. Yep, because the H wasn't pronounced. It was or. Um, did they have an H sound? Yes, they did. How did they spell it? SH. Because the SH was a lenited S, which was pronounced H. So they would, they would um, 
where they needed a huh sound, they would spell it SH. And we know that from when they transcribed other languages, English and Latin, and that had this SH in their transcriptions. Uh, good night, Hervais. I've kept you up far too long. I intend to keep people up further. Um, which is one of the weaknesses of Ogham. If we step back, Ogham had a letter for H. There is not a single period inscription in primitive Irish that uses it. We know they had it, and it was a simple one. It, was, it wasn't complicated, but the letter for H was a single stroke on one side of the line. One of the most basic possible signs you could have in Ogham, and they never ever used it. Ogham also had letters for, we think a Z or a Z sound called strife, and for metal, for the ng sound. They're also never used. Because Ogham, okay, the structure of Ogham, how do we know they had it is the question. Ogham is a line and there are strokes. So you've either got one, two, three, four, or five notches. One, two, three, four, or five big diagonal strokes across the line one, two, three, four, or five notches on one side of the line or on the other side of the line. Each of those is a letter, which makes it complicated, especially if you lose track or if you have two letters, which are both, you know, notches or lines on one side of the line and they all get too close and you have So we've got seven lines here and I can't see where there's lines. So is that a B, then an L or is that a... Uh... So it, it gets complicated and it takes a bit of trickiness to read it. H is that one letter. And when we get to things like the Aurakep the Nekas, where they were writing about these letters, they gave their names, they gave their values. They didn't need a letter S either. They didn't need a letter L either. But it was there, so they used it. By that stage, they did need a letter P. So in manuscript Ogham that they were using in Middle Irish and later, they invented this squiggle letter P to add. They call them the uh, forfeda. Uh, there was one forfeda that was used in primitive Irish, and that was a cross across the line. In later manuscripts, that was an air sound. In primitive Irish, that was a K. And it's transcribed as a K, not a C, because um, it was used only ever in the word koi which as near as we can figure it is the primitive Irish for here lies or here is. So it, it was the formula word that was the equivalent of the Latin hic yacet. It was only ever used in that word, but that's how we know that's what it meant then. So we know they had an H. Um, the old Irish had an H, but they used it to disambiguate the semi-vowel of you and I to bulk up words like e. They might spell E as H-I, just to make it look more impressive. So you didn't get that little, tiny little lost I didn't get, get, get hidden in the rest of the page. Um, and they used it to spell lenition, sometimes. Latin had three lenited letters it could use because the Romans learned a lot from the Greeks. And when the Greeks were coming up with their alphabets, they had this really nice alphabet. You had the plosives, tau, pi, kappa, p, t, k. And you could do things to those three letters. You could add voice to them. Beta, delta, gamma. You could add an S to them and aspirate them. So, seta, psi, xi. You, when the Greeks originally did it, you could aspirate them. You could add a huh after it. So it became uh, teta. Uh, what's the uh, pi? And um, chi. That k sound eventually turned into da 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 lenition. So what you ended up with was phi theta and chi. 
when the Romans borrowed those letters, they were still aspirated. So they spelt it as the sound plus a breath of air. K, H, C, H, T, H, P, H, for Chi, Pi, Teta. As it, um, as the Greek pronunciation changed, the Roman pronunciation changed, but their spelling didn't. So the Romans had these letters for th, ch, or ch, not ch quite yet, but ch, and um, th. When it got to Ireland, we have these plosives, and we have these obviously related lenited forms. So the Irish grabbed those obviously lenited forms and they use them with alacrity. So here we have Acha, CH, it's a lenited C. Inoch, CH. Uh, Lothlind, TH. We don't have any PHs in there because this is still early enough that they were still getting their head around the concept of a P. But they had these lenited letters. Most of the consonants could be lenited. How did you spell it? Well, for an S or an F, the phonetic difference is so strong that they had to show it somehow. So what they do, in, in an S's case, it turned into, an, into a H sound. For an F, it disappeared completely. A lenited F was not pronounced at all. So what they do is, you see in this word furia, there's a C, and they've written a dot underneath it, and two G's above. That dot is called a punctus delens, a dot of deletion. It's a cue to the reader. Oops, I screwed up. This is a spelling mistake. Ignore this letter. This letter doesn't actually exist. It looks like it's there, but you should ignore it. And they've written the correction above. Finnalt, you have an F, which is clearly there because it's compound. They know what the second word started with, but it's got a dot over it, symbolically deleting it. This letter is not there. You think you see it, but you shouldn't say it because it's not actually there. So SH and FH were actually done with these dots over the top, these um, dots of deletion. If you actually wanted to delete them, you'd put another dot underneath. Because, yeah, you had to work around these things. That was how Old Irish did lenition. CH, TH, PH, S with a dot over the top, F with a dot over the top, everything else you had to figure out from context, which sometimes makes it um, entertaining. By the time you got to Middle Irish, I don't know how clear it is, but if you look at this T here, this T here, you see that little T shape or half an H shape over the top of the letter. That is something they borrowed from Greek. Uh, Greek has the spiritus asper. So you have the, the breathed and the unbreathed version of most of the consonants and you uh, indicate it by, at the time, you'd have a spiritus uh, lentis or a spiritus um, fortis. A, a sign of breath. That's what that is. That's a Greek symbol that they used in Latin to indicate an Irish phonetic thing that was also grammatical by this stage. Later on, what they do is the dot and that um, spiritus asper will be merged into, sometimes it would be a little H shape or a, a shape like that. Sometimes it would be an H afterwards because I believe there are actually cases where yeah, there's TH right there. C with a spiritus asper. T with a spiritus asper. So when we say it has to be one or the other, they'd use both. They'd have no lenition shown. They'd have H's after the letter. They'd have a dot over the letter. They'd have a little H shape as a Greek spiritus asper over the letter, all in the same sentence. All to, to indicate, you know, this is lenition going on. Uh, so that's 
clinician. Nasalization started as a, a N sound before the letter or an N if it was a labial like a P or a B. It turned into eclipsis where you'd have another letter entirely sitting before that sound. So uh, a T is lenited by a D. Uh, a G is lenited by an N. Not lenited, sorry, eclipsed. Words, I can words. These all make absolute sense and they were all necessary at the time. They were working with the orth orthography they had to indicate the language they were using. So all of these things made sense as they were adding them. Um, why is, are these important? Because they showed the grammar. Take the um, particle which indicates possession, my. So that's mo, for me, mo, do. Um, mo and do both lenite. So let's take an example the word uh, board, which means boat. My boat is mo, board, do, board. The word that means his or her or their is a in all cases. So how can you tell who owns the boat? A vod. His boat. A bod. Her boat. A mod, which I should spell correctly, their boat. Without the initial mutation, you can't tell. It is really, really important in Irish and not getting the initial mutation right in Irish is like using the wrong definite article in French. If you say la pont in French, a Frenchman will look at you like, you've, like you're a complete idiot and they may be right. It's that sort of, or um, um, I am for buying his fishes in English. It's that level of wrong. When you, they know what you meant, but it's still wrong. So that's where lenition and initial mutation comes in. Uh, I'm about an hour in, so maybe I should start to, well, a little bit further about the sections of Irish. So we've talked about primitive Irish, which is up to about 600. Old Irish between about 600 and 900. Middle Irish between 900 and 1200. And 1200 is a nice round number because that's when the Normans invaded Strongbow, all of that going on. So Middle Irish was strong transition when it was neither really Old Irish or Modern Irish. After 1200, what's going on? From the Book of Deer, we know that Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic were already starting to split. It was subtle, but it was there. So things like the name Forgus. The genitive of Forgus in Irish is Forgusa. So the son of Fergus is Mok Forgusa. In the Book of Deer, it's Mok Forgish which is a different declension and a much more common one. Forgus to Forgish is what you'd expect from an O stem noun in, in primitive Irish. That's really, really, really common. Like a second declension noun in Latin. Most of them were of that sort of thing. Forgus is an I stem, I think, and is comparatively a lot rarer. the Scots were simplifying the language. The Scots, mind you, had been living in the Dol Rieda among the Picts and surrounded by the Norse for hundreds of years by this stage. So they had all of this linguistic contact and then the, the English and the Welsh battering on their doors from the south, all of this linguistic contact. More linguistic contact tends to simplify a language. It, like a pebble in a stream, it knocks all the rough edges off. 
Sometimes it adds more complexity back in by adding new constructs from the different language, but that's the general idea as it simplifies things. Um, but by the time you get to 1600, it's still practically the same language. Some new words have come in over the intervening hundreds of years. Some grammar has changed a little bit over the hundreds of years, but whether it's written down in Scotland or in Ireland in a proper book, it still looks pretty much the same across that entire period. Why? Because early modern Irish can also be called classical Irish. It was a literary language that they were speaking and transmitting all across that whole region. So most of these annals weren't written in early modern Irish. They were written in classical Irish, which is like your absolute best schoolboy Irish. The, the, the stuff you pull out for an academic conference, not the stuff you buy a beer with down at the pub. The spoken language was changing underneath, but the culture of education was keeping it tied closely to this classical form. Then after 1600, when you had the flight of the earls in Ireland and the um, lots of things going on in Scotland, like say some king moving south and lots of political upheaval, the academic tradition started to be degraded and that's when things started to really suddenly change because all the things that were keeping it uh, consistent had been removed and suddenly it could just change without um, all these um, silly academic people telling you, no, 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 you're spelling that wrong. So the period between 1600 and the 18th century was a time of fairly rapid change. Then it started to be killed. Then there was the revival in the early 20th, well, late 19th, early 20th century. And that's a whole other, there are literally books written about just that, but we're not worried about that so much. So for most of the, things that you'll find over the classical Irish period. They're written in more or less the same language and a modern Irish speaker will have trouble with them. There are all these words they won't know. There are these grammatical things going on that they won't understand, but they'll probably get the gist of it. Except for something like the book of Innisfallen. The annals of Innisfallen were updated every 20 years or so. So they, we think there was a scratch book that they were writing down what was going on. And every 20 years, someone would go and fill in the, the good book with what had been going on. Every generation, someone would be given the task of updating the annals. The handwriting changes every 20 years. Um, and it looks to be spelt as if they hadn't been taught Irish and were spelling it phonetically. So we can see how words were pronounced by looking at the misspellings in the Annals of Innisfallen. Um, so let's talk about names. There are lots of different types of names going on in, in Irish. You start with, you go back to the Celtic tradition. Most of them were deuterothematic. You had two parts to them. Uh, Dumno Valos. So uh, 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 foreign world is, is roughly the translation of that one. They were relatively simple. The Romans knew how to uh, transcribe them and conjugate them. So Vercingetorix. Boldovidas. Um, that, that sort of thing. Go through into <clears throat> earlier Welsh and Irish. A lot of those names were still around, but they had all of the bits rounded off them, more of the simplification, more of this moving from Proto-Gaelic to Primitive Irish to Old Irish, bits knocked off. So Dolvnu, um, Cathgol, uh, uh There were simple ones like Ive, Toig, uh, only in Old Irish, it would have been Aev and Toivr. All of those bits that we don't pronounce were pronounced then. All of those DHs and GHs and BHs and things were pronounced. And we know this because the Vikings like to capture slaves. And sometimes Irishmen caught a lift on a boat and ended up in Iceland and got their names written down there. 
Um, there is a name, in fact, she's related to Clannad. If you've ever heard of the singer Enya, which is, she spells on all of her albums, E-N-Y-A, because she doesn't expect English speakers to be able to get it right. And by and large, she's probably right. In Irish, Enya is E-I-T-H-N-E. -E. But it's still Enya. Where'd the T-H go? Things happen to it. Go back to Irish times, there is a woman who ended up in Iceland in the Islendingarvok, whose name is spelt E -ev -n -i -a. E-V-N-I-A. The TH was a V when she went to Iceland which is a pretty fair indication that that's how that, that sound was pronounced in most of the other parts. We, Dovgol. Yeah, Dovgol was um, Dovgol, a black foreigner, which is one of the words for the Norwegians. A fair foreigner was a Swede, no, a Fingal. So you have the uh, king of Dublin being referred to as the uh, Ri Fingalach Agus Dovgalach. King of the fair, fair foreigners and the dark foreigners. Um, so you've got those old original Irish names coming in. Some of them were compounds in primitive Irish and Celtic that have survived and got rounded down and simplified. Uh, Donnell is one of those. Um, some of them are like simple words. Ive means fire or flame. And they'd sometimes riff off that when they were writing poetry about someone. Tavag uh, or Toig, who knows what the hell that was, but it was sometimes a name was just a name. It didn't have to mean anything. It was just something you called someone. You get to the fifth and sixth century, fourth, fifth, sixth century, the Christians started coming in. They started borrowing Christian names like Johannes, which they borrowed as Johan. Because the is, the, the, in the time from primitive Irish to old Irish, the endings were dropping off. So the is on the end of Johannes dropped off along with the rest of them. And then we le got left with Yoan, E-O-I-N. So that's just John that was borrowed in the fifth century. Um, Michal. Uh, you had all of these saints. Some of them had... Irish names that got turned into saints names remembered that way. Some of them had Latin names. Uh, some of them had nicknames that they got called by. Uh, one in particular, uh, he got called the, the dove of the church. Columba Ecclesia, or in Irish, Columba Killia, Colum Killy. Um, what you also had was sometimes these names were so holy that they just didn't feel comfortable using them for their own children. Yeah, you wouldn't call your son Jesus. You might call him Jesus, but that's a different thing. So what they do is call him the servant of Jesus. Moil Isa. You might call him the servant of Colum Killy. I know that was a bit long. So they'd call him Moil Colum. The servant of the dove, which turned to Malcolm. So that's where Malcolm comes from, the servant of the dove of the church. There were three main words they used for servant of. Mail, M A E L in Old Irish, M A O L in Modern Irish, same pronunciation, originally meant shaved. So before the Christians turned up, before the Christians turned up, what the Irish would do is they'd shave the heads of their slaves so that you could tell who was a slave or not. Having your head shaved was a sign of either you were a slave or you were a druid. Because what the druids would do is they had their own special haircut where they'd draw a line from ear to ear over the top of their head and shave everything to the front of it. The original hardcore mullet. So if you called someone moil, you were saying either that they were a druid and therefore you know, religiously devoted, or they were a slave. And a monk 
and their tonsure is kind of both especially because the celtic tonsure and remember they had you know they didn't exactly go to war but if they could have they probably would have over it they had wars over which tonsure to use there was the roman tonsure you know the corona the crown and there was the celtic tonsure which was just like the old druids used to use which is one of the reasons why the romans didn't like it that much but the irish went yeah screw you we're using it anyway so either way you count that mile meant someone who was devoted in some sort of religious or servile way and like i said for a, for a monk you were basically both the other one is gila which is just a word for a boy so um, if anyone's old enough to have learned French back in the 70s, when you, when you would call a waiter with Gasson, Gasson, ici, s'il vous plaît, s'il te plaît, Gasson, it's, it's literally calling someone a boy, which in the context, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, fosterage and getting people out as, as um, house servants, you were calling them a servant. So. Um, Gila Issa is Jesus's boy, Jesus's servant. Women could also be called these things. So there's, uh, I think, a case of a woman named Moil Moira, who is shaved for Mary, a servant of Mary. But they also had Kailia. Kailia or Kailia originally came from the Latin word palia, which is a veil. So a veiled person could be an old woman, could be a nun. Um, it, it turned into Kayach became hag, because clearly um, a, a widow would wear a veil and a widow was probably old and old pet women are obviously not people. So Kayach became hag. But back then it meant a nun. So a woman who is devoted to. So Kayach they is a nun of God, God's God's veiled woman. Um, then the Vikings turned up. You had names like Olaf. Olaf is from Olaf. Simple. Sitrig. From Sitrig. Um, so the Olaf, Olaf Koran. Olaf the Sandal. The famous king of Dublin. Magnus. All of these Viking names started entering the Irish naming pattern. There were some English people, you know, as in Anglo-Saxons traveling back and forth, there was some interaction with those. So words like boat, the bod in uh, Irish, we think is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word for a boat, not from the Viking or anything like that. But the next big change happened when Strongbow and the Normans went over the channel and set up in Dublin. And that's when you start getting all of these Norman names. Um, Uga. So if I type in the chat, UJA is Hugo. Uh, Shimon, Simon, Sean, John, took a really wide berth around, around the place. So it was started as um, Johannes, uh, started as Aramaic, was borrowed into Greek, was borrowed by the Romans, taken to the British Isles, where it was originally borrowed as Johan, went to France, where Johannes became Johannes, the Y became Sh, Shehan, the H got dropped when the Irish saw it, and Jehan became Sean. Um, and there was a lot of that going on, so Sean got borrowed in twice. And over the next period, you had more and more of these English names coming in and being Richard from Richard. Uh, Oh, another type of Irish name I should probably mention is the two-word name, Macbeth, Macraw. You know, the, like Macbeth, the, uh, the, the Scottish play. He was not the son of Beth. He was the son of Bethard, which is life. 
Macbeth was his given name. One word. So the son of Macbeth would be Mac Macbeth. Uh, Macroith, son of the wheel, I think. Uh, Macchen, son of fire. There, there are a few of these words going on as well. Nathi was one of the early ones, which we think means descendant of the, the uncle. It's a, it's a weird one, but it's, it's one of the ones. He was a famous king. Um, so let's talk about a bit about grammar. Genitives. When you're talking about a name, what you want is a genitive. The genitive... What is it? Good God, do I only have 10 minutes left? This could take a whole book by itself. There are multiple ways of taking a genitive of a name you could slenderize the last syllable. So remember I was talking about an O-stem noun. Um, so donchi is D-O-N-C-H-A-D. Uh, donchi, to slenderize it, you put an I in there, which changes the pronunciation of the final D. So the, the uh, son of donchi is don there is a difference when pronunciation is just subtle for us one time I got caught out there was a guy in the Irish annals in the 15th century called Far Gun Anim Gun means without Anim means name so he was literally the man without a name that was his name his name was Anonymous. Only I was telling a, uh, a Gaelic speaker about this and I didn't pronounce the slenderization correctly. And what she heard was Fargan Anam, which is the far more hardcore man without a soul, which she thought was very metal. Uh, but so I completely skipped over the slenderization. There are two types of consonants in Irish and in Scottish Gaelic, broad and slender. If it's got an I next to it, it's slender. If it's got most other letters next to it, it's broad. There is a difference in pronunciation. It is clear, it is obvious, it changes the meaning and it's very clear. So where you have um, say I, the Long A means that it's, that's the main letter. The I is just there to tell you what the next syllable is. So, uh, Slornia isn't, I'm sorry to say, slain. It's the A is the main letter. The I is just there to tell you that it's a N, not a N. Where you start having fun is where you have the lenighted letters. So, uh, just to use another word, dwarf is uh, the BH is a V. Dwarf, which is the same adjective in a uh, genitive context, is a, a IV rather than oof. Uh, that's, that would be dull. Or is that would be dive? MH and BH, I should point out, were pronounced almost identically and they were getting confused back in Old Irish. So there's a historical person in one of the myths called Ever, which in some works is E V uh, E M E R, in some works is E B E R. Technically, it's ever for a B and ever for a, a lenighted M. But even they couldn't hear the difference consistently. So BH and MH are both just V. Um, yes, S-I-O-B-H-A-N, Siobhan. The O is really there to tell you that it's a broad V sound. Um, 
and the other one that everyone likes to hate is Niv. And then you have Toig, where the ADH becomes an OI sound. It's not always easy to tell what lenition or uh, palatalization will do to a consonant, to a syllable. Sometimes you just have to check modern Irish and see what they do with it. And then you'll find that they do it different things to it, depending on where you are in Ireland. There is a dictionary online called Tionglom, which is Irish for a language place. It has a section where you can actually listen to the pronunciation of the words. So you go to the you know, pronunciation or um, if you're looking at the Irish, it's called fuim, the sound, and there are recordings of the word being pronounced in three different regions in Ulster, Connacht and Munster, you know, North, Middle and South. And they sometimes will be wildly different depending on the word you pick and the uh, grammatical form you pick. The I really am running out of time, aren't I? And I could have gone for probably another half an hour to an hour. Um, grammar, the patronym, you have name, mark or inken, which is son or daughter. And then the almost always father's name in the genitive case, which is why not needing to know the genitive is so important and why not being able to figure out the genitive is so infuriating. Um, that's a simple patronym. Some of these patronyms became fixed as surnames. So um, McDonnell is a, originally there was a guy who was a son of Donald that became a surname and now it's the McDonald family. Um, O'Neill or meant a descendant from or um, grandchild of. Or Neil is a descendant of Neil. And there's a few Neils in uh, fifth, sixth century Ireland that they could be picking off. O'Brien is a descendant of Brian, which is Brian Borua, almost always, who was the king who stopped the various O'Neill families from being the um, high kings of the north of, Scot of, of Ireland. Uh, in Scotland, you had more classical influence. So you had names like David, Alexander, um, Magnus coming in there from, from classical influences. And as well, part of that, you also had by names. I'm really running out of time to talk about this. I should probably write a book. I keep threatening to write a book. By names could be an adjective where you describe someone as being brown, red, tall, rough, short. It could be a word as an attribute of the horse of the hills of the lake when you're saying of the place name it could mean that they're associated with it it could mean they're from that sort of place it could be a place name where they are in that name as an adjective so brethnach means welsh uh Brethon means of wales they're different constructions and they'd sometimes use them for different things going on uh, I probably could go on. I could go on for days and days and days and no one's interrupted me. You've all been either very patient or, or um, very masochistic listening to me going on and on without interrupting me even once. Um, so there is a difference between a genitive construct and an adjectival construct. In English, we tend to treat them basically the same way. Any noun can be verbed, any adjective can be nouned, any noun can be adjectived. You can treat it as an appositional construct. You can just shove things together. In Welsh, you have to. Welsh doesn't have a genitive. So to, to describe a genitive construct in Welsh, you just grab two nouns and jam them together. And the second one relates to the first. Irish, you have to have a genitive construct. If you've got multiple adjectives and, or multiple genitives describing a name and you have a definite article in there, um, Irish, you only have one definite article and it's stuck just before the last noun in the phrase. It's just a thing. 
you probably won't run into it in names. It's just a curiosity. Um, Welsh means foreigner in Old English. I, I meant to mention that. Cornwall and Wales weren't originally called that. The people who lived in Cornwall were the Cornerway. The people who lived in Wales were the Britons or the, the, the people from their nation were the Cymru. So modern Wales is Cymru and uh, modern Cornwall in Cornish is Cornerweg. The wall is from an old English word meaning foreigner and you'll also find it in Walloon and Wallachia. That's the same word meaning a foreign person in, in all of those places. Um, as an extension of that, the name Gaelic in Scots it's um, uh, Gaelic, in Irish it's Gaelic or Gaelic. You go back to Middle Irish and it's spelled something like Gaelic. Um, you go back further, they're pretty sure what that originally comes from is a Welsh word meaning um, strange, wild, hairy person out of the woods. So Gael and Gaelic both come from a, um, the, the same sort of place that Wales, Wales and Welsh comes from. It, it's so far on. It, it's so far back that even by the time of the first myths, the Irish were talking about how Gaelic was as a language. Um, one of the daughters of the Pharaoh was hanging around the people who were building the Tower of Babel. And when the Tower of Babel thing happened, either Irish was the language that everything else was split from, or they had some scholars go around and pick the best bits of all of the other languages and join them together and called it Irish. So they, they um, didn't have uh, tickets on themselves whatsoever. Uh, look, the rules for lenition and eclipsis and um, in the context, you've got to know the genders of the words going on. So after Ingen or Ban, meaning a wife, they're both feminine. Words after those will almost certainly be lenited. But as you've seen, spelling lenition in period was wildly variable for the entire time that they were writing it down. In primitive Irish, they just didn't because it wasn't even a thing. It was a purely predictable part of where the letter was in the word. In old Irish, they did it for some letters and not for others. In middle and early modern Irish, it was whatever the scribe felt like it seemed sometimes. And they'd change, they'd have different ways of doing it within the same word, including not spelling it at all. So, at some point, I'm going to write an article saying that we really shouldn't have a hard division between Old Irish and Middle and Early Modern as the whole. Because a major change is when you change languages and the modern at the moment between Old Irish and Middle Irish, I believe, is a language change and is a major change. And when people tick that little horrible box, it means we can't fix it. I want to make the case that we can, uh, we can make that change. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. You are waving at me. You can't unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. Why can't I unmute you? I don't know. I can unmute myself, so. Ah, okay, he's good. He was just waving, not drowning. Um, the rules become complicated. One of the other things that trips people up is the concept called delinition, where if you have a, a, a word which would induce lenition because it used to end in a vowel a thousand years before and now doesn't and would induce lenition, but the letter it does end with now is similar enough to the letter that the next word starts with that undoes the lenition that it would have done which is why uh, if you have it <laughs> and Arthur Thorogold's daughter falls over. It's, yeah, it's one of those things. So 
Eng and Donnell doesn't unite because D and N are both dentals. It's just a thing. Um, is there so, a, a, a short uh, chart of those letters and those letters combinations someplace? Because that, that is one that I am like, don't have it all. So a, a, a brief chart of, you know, this plus this equals no would be great. Um, there's no ways, um, I could certainly try and look one up. It, it, that when you get into these sort of weeds, there's stuff, but it's all over the place. So I'm, when I'm looking for things, I'm pulling some things out of Deneen's Irish dictionary. I'm pulling some things out of, um, Thornason. I'm pulling some things out of the introduction to old Irish. I'm pulling some things out of old Irish words and vocabulary. Um, the, the guy who wrote this, I'm pretty sure, edits the old Irish entries on, on Wiktionary. Um, and then when you're getting really into the weeds, there's things like the uh, Corpus Inscriptionum Insularum uh, Celticarum. But if you don't want to look at this, there is a website called the CISP which is literally just a list of Celtic inscriptions and their transcriptions. And remember I showed you the Ogham stone? That's where I got that information from. They're all there, it's up, it's lookable. Uh, there is a, the Dictionary of the Irish Language is a historical dictionary of Irish. It is also online, the EDIL. I quote from that a lot and it goes into a lot of detail. Um, a lot of the works that I, work from, especially the annals. Okay, so you've got these crumbling old books that were transcribed, probably transcribed a couple of times. So you might start with a book that they started writing in the 800s. The book started falling apart, so they transcribe it in the 1200s. Then it will be copied by some scholars in the 17th century, like say, the Four Masters or Geoffrey Keating into this one big massive tome of here are all of the things that happened over the last 4,000 years since God created the earth. The other books might be lost. They might not. We'd have this book. They would be copied by 19th century paleographers and they'd print it in various, news, various articles. Then that would be taken and digitized and turned into SGML text. And then that would be put up on a website called Kelt the corpus of electronic literary texts. And they have all of these things in digitized form, searchable, but they've been normalized over a thousand years. So things like the Four Masters, the Four Masters is complete. It covers from the beginning of the world through to when they were writing in the early 17th century but they updated the spellings with wild abandon. So you can't always tell that that was the original spelling. They might've got things wrong, but sometimes we have the books that they copied from. Sometimes we don't, and we've only got their version of these events to, to work from, and, but we can extrapolate from what, how things have changed. Sometimes you've got things like the Annals of Innisfallen where they were keeping it updated over all of those centuries. Sometimes you've got something like the uh, Annals of Ulster where they were writing it at the time, and then it got left in a box somewhere and forgotten about and then pulled out later. When it got transcribed into diplomatic editions and published, the person who did that would, they'd skip this letter because it was deleted. They'd skip that word because it was obviously misspelled. They'd update this spelling because, oh, we know what they meant. They'd expand these contractions because, you know, dot I, that's, you know, it on or ingen or mac. And then it would be transcribed into Celt and digitized, and then they'd update it again. Uh, this person turned all of the MC into Mac or make, but that's not what they had. So we'll just transcribe all of them back, but they don't have access to the original manuscript. So they don't know which ones he updated and which ones were like that when he got them. So they might be overdoing the transcription back. So there's, <clears throat> you can't always take them with a grain of salt because they're several steps removed, even the ones that are closest. But they're the best we've got. So that's what we use. And at some point we have to say, 
especially to the submitter, this is the best information we've got. This is the best information you've got. You're using it in good faith. This accords with the best of our knowledge. And we go with that. So that, that's, <clears throat> that's where a lot of those things go from. Uh, if you want to know about things like pronunciation and rhythms and which syllables were kept and which were lost, poetry. That's how you know that for most languages, for Anglo-Saxon, for Old French. You, if you want to know how it was actually pronounced, you go read some poetry and then you sound it out until it makes sense. And then you figure out what the rules were that, that made it do that. The grammar, probably not so much because poetry always did weird things with grammar, but the pronunciation is usually a good way of sorting through that, especially in Irish, because they'd been formalizing poetry since before they were writing it down. They had a 2000 year long tradition of formal poetry and study of poetry of Bardicht and Filicht. Um, in fact, I, at some point I want to register a alternate title for master for master of the laurel as Olav, O-L-L-A-V-H, which is the modern Irish word for a professor. Um, and it means a master of a skill. So they talk about an olive driacht, uh, a, a master of wizardry, an olive brahunacht, a master of judging, olive dana, olive re dana, an olive, uh, a master of poetry. It was uh, a wonderful, and it was also unisex. I mean, they didn't write about many female masters of things because but, but there's no reason why olive couldn't refer to a woman as well. So if you're looking for a, an inclusive title for a m member of the Order of the Laurel, that doesn't include a reference to um, ownership of people. I reckon that's a pretty good one. Um, but yeah, they had this tradition, they used it, they formalized it in an olive of all wisdom. I like that. Well, one of, one of the, um, the Kukulin stories, Kukulin married um, Eva, who was the, one of the smartest women of her time, not just the most beautiful, but when Kukulin was courting Eva, the story goes that he would sit in a room and she would be surrounded by her whole family as uh, witnesses to make sure they didn't try and get up to anything. And then Kukulin and Eva proceeded to talk each other's pants off, almost literally, in code and poetry and abstruse references that no one else in the room got, to the point where the legend goes through their conversation, then goes outside and Kukulin's charioteer says, what just happened? And Kukulin goes through the entire conversation, phrase by phrase saying, and in this pit, I was complimenting her breasts. And her response said that I hadn't earned a look at them yet. That level of, he married her for her brains. And one of the later stories, one of the tragedies of Kukulin's only son is when Kukulin's son, who he had while he was learning to be a warrior, to be good enough to marry Eva in the first place. Long story, lots of things going on. Um, he was given a set of sucker gases, which a uh, gas is a magical imposition to obey a certain set of rules. And Kukulin's son was to find his father, to never turn down a challenge and never to tell anyone his name. So, of course, when he got to Ireland, he was met by Cúchulain, who said, who are you? I can't tell you. Tell me or I'll kill you. I can't tell you. Cúchulain fought him, killed him, and his son gave him Cúchulain's old ring back and said, when you find my father, give this to him. And Cúchulain realized he just killed his only son. So that's the tragedy of Cúchulain's only son. But at one point, it mentions that Ava had figured it out, rushed down to the beach, and said, everyone, for God's sake, step back and stop fighting, you bunch of testosterone-poisoned idiots. And women's liberation only went so far, so they all told her to go back into the kitchen. But they made the point in the myth that everything would have been fine if only they hadn't gone Romeo and Juliet and listened to the goddamn woman. Um, I think I'm running out of things to say. Does anyone want to unmute and ask me a question or fall asleep at me or... I've got a question. Yep. Um, my 
SCA name. I've never been able to figure out how to pronounce it. Everybody calls me Bane, but it's spelled B accented A I N E. Bonya. 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 The the palatalization on the consonants. Think of it a bit like the. Do you know any Russian? No. Niet. Da. <laughs> That's about it. Niet. Niet is palatalized. There's a soft sign in there, which makes the n, n a nye. Without the soft That's sign, what I was it's, thinking. It's, without the soft sign, it's net. So the palatalization in Russian, the thing that makes it sound Russian, the n sound in niet, it's the same palatalized N as in bonya. Okay. That's palatalization happening. That's the I accentation of a consonant. Okay, so the B is pronounced like a V? No, it's a broad B that's bonya. Bonya. Yep. And Got it. <clears throat> Uh, now I can correct people. <laughs> and if it's, if it's got a short A, it's bonya, which is the word for milk. Oh, no, this is the long A. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it possible to email me questions? Uh, Gronya and Slonya. A double N in Old Irish was also spelt ND. It, it used to, it originally was an ND, but the D assimilated and became an, a, a lengthened tensor N. Um, as opposed to a short end. Sometimes they'd, they'd, they'd get them mixed up, but usually they wouldn't. There was a difference between an N and an N. Gromaga Kincha. Gromaga Eve. And Unless anyone has any other questions, I think I might let everyone go to their well-deserved beds. Ich war